Moonlight on the Marsh Lecture Series. It's an abbreviated series that we refer to as a special valedictory lecture series. I'll explain that next week. <laughs> but there's only two talks in this year's series. Uh, today with Bernie Master, and next week uh, I will be giving the final lecture. And uh, we couldn't start better with the with uh, Bernie, Bernie Master. He has been the fiscal support for this Moonlight on the March lecture for almost, he and his wife uh, are, are the fiscal support of this Moonlight on the March, I think for almost every year we've had it in Florida. And so God bless you guys for, for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Bernie Master is a distinguished healthcare professional to say the least. And he's a business entrepreneur qualified by 36 years of being serving the inner city low income and elderly population in Columbus, Ohio. Dealing <laughs> <laughs> with health and high, high effective health care system throughout the state of Ohio and other regions as well. Uh, it was publicly traded on NASDAQ and uh, he served over 52,000 patients in his uh, legacy as a healthcare profession. Uh, so, in addition to that, unbelievable uh, accomplishments in the health field, he uh, is an internationally recognized conservationist. He has a life list that includes over three quarters of the world's bird species in excess of 8,000 birds. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the air still come out more. He's the first American to see representatives of every bird family in the world. So, in addition, and, and he was honored by a the Royal Highness Prince Bernard in the Netherlands for his contribution to the conservation. Um, and he has a bird named after it. It's a uh, Virio Masteri. It's a, what was it, Columbia? Columbia. <laughs> and uh, that happened, what, in 1996 when he made the bird for it? Uh, actually, in 93, and I, I'll tell the story. Yeah, yeah. He's also served in, in many roles within the university system. He, he's consistently been uh, hanging around me, I guess, <laughs> both at Ohio State, where he was on the advisory committee for the Old Tangy River Wetland Research Park for many years. And then when I moved down here, and I was giving the first lecture of the Moonlight on the March series uh, in this very room. I looked over and I said, wait a minute, that's pretty master sitting there. <laughs> so he surprised me in a joyous way and, and we stayed connected down here. And as I said, he's, he, and, uh, he and his wife have uh, more or less supported this series so that you guys don't have to pay for it. I think you would appreciate that. So, uh, I'll give you a couple more points, then I'll turn it over to him. Uh, he's a founding member of the Ohio the Ohio Nature Conservancy for 11 years, founding member of the Ohio Ornithological uh, Society, and a community board member of COSI, which is the, our uh, museum. The Center of Science and Industry. Yeah. In the central Ohio. And then he served on the Green Fund Committee of the Columbus Foundation for 16 years. He has also sponsored the oldest professional tennis court tournament in Ohio. Uh, it's still going on? Still going on. Now 45 40, years. Thir 40, third year now? 45 years without hesitant interruption. <laughs> so what a, what a diverse guy this is. <laughs> and he's a Vietnam veteran. and. Uh, has three children and six grandchildren. And what I wanted to do was wave his book that he did at the junior. Oh, I knew he had it. 
It's called No Finish Line, and it was in 2015. 2015. And it's a story of transposing his life of being a murderer and his uh, role in the Vietnam War in the medical arm of the, of the uh, U.S. Army. And it's just brilliant way pieces those two ideas totally disparate into a very readable book. I recommend it highly, and I think he's going to recommend it to you as well. <laughs> so, without any further delay, please allow me to introduce Bernard Master, Dr. Bernard Master. And nobody's put up his title, so I can't tell him. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. yes. Bill, thanks for that introduction <clears throat> that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I've been associated with Bill Mitch 25 years, about 10 here, and the rest at Ohio State in Columbus. And, um, I appreciate your asking me to speak in front of this group. Uh, usually I'm the introductory. I, I get two minutes and then I sit down and listen to, to the real experts. And it's a great honor and a privilege to be associated with you, Bill Mitch, who I consider to be the greatest wetland man in America. He may be the greatest in the world, but I don't know those other guys. <laughs> but I can say he is number one in the United States of America. about birds. I started when I was four years old. My first bird list had nine birds, all in Philadelphia where I grew up. My dad was a birder. He was a doctor in Philadelphia. Before he discovered golf, <laughs> he used to go out every weekend and look at birds. And so, as a toddler, for me, to be closer to him, I used to go with him. And then I learned bird calls and how to identify birds. And his group of birders were the best in the world. They were all part of the Museum of Natural History in Philadelphia, which had probably more PhDs than any university country. Not only birds, weather, geology, snakes, moths, you name it, there was a guy there who knew everything about it. Can you imagine how fantastic that was for a teenager? I carried a lot of that with me and I continue to be a birder even through my medical education. And when I started my practice in Columbus, I always found time, maybe it was once a month, maybe it was an hour, to get out and look at birds. Why birds? They are truly the canary in the coal shaft. And they're pre-monetary for anything negative that's going to happen to our environment. And when you learn birds, and I think the birders here will vouch for it. I see Sharon, who's a terrific birder, who's birding in Maryland and Delaware. When you see birds, you also learn all the other allied sciences. You learn about geology. Moss and butterflies. 
They learn about water. It goes on culture, history. It's just a mind-blowing experience. It's not alone, because you can do that same if you love moths or you love snakes. You learn everything that surrounds these creatures that you're so passionate about. Now, before I get on with the regular program, I have to tell you a St. Patty's joke. <laughs> now, Duke and Javid have heard this. Maybe Tom, Mace, and Judy, because it's my favorite joke. <laughs> um, Irish bar in downtown New York, in Manhattan. Guy walks in the bar, gets up on the stool. I'm a Jameson. Coming right up. Irish whiskey can, shot, boom, right down. He looks over, there's another fellow on a bar stool. You say, mate, where are you from? I'm from Ireland. Ireland! Me too! Bartender, two Jamesons. Whiskey comes, pop, pop them down, you know, schlock, down it goes. What part of Ireland? Dublin. Dublin! Me too! Two Jamesons. Bartender comes, two shots. Boom! Pop them right down. Who part of Dublin? What parish? St. Patrick's. Me too. Bartender. <laughs> Duke's laughing. He knows what's coming. Two Jamesons. Whiskey comes. Schlant. Boom! Pop them right down. What school did you go to? What primary school? St. Mary's. No. Me too. Barkeep. Two Jamesons. Boom. Down. Another guy walks in the bar. Third guy. Sits on a stool. Says, hey, Patty. <laughs> How are things going? He said, ah, same old, same old. The McGillicuddy twins are here and they're... They're drunk out of their minds. <laughs> I figured if you didn't like that, I'll stick to birds. And I think we'll, we'll move on. Now, <laughs> I, the hardest part of this lecture was to select out of my 20,000 images of birds from all seven continents, what to show you. And each one I decided I would show you has a little tiny vignette to it, a little story. And I think I'll have you out of here in an hour. Yeah. So I happened to find a very rare video. I want to show you first. We know how hard Dr. Mitch works to put together this lecture series. So I found a video of him putting together the talks. Thanks, Bill, for all the work that you do. 
for us. That's, uh, Matt, that's a little fuzzy. Is there any way we can sharpen that, or is that just it? Um, I started, by 1989, I had seen every regularly occurring bird in the United States. Everyone. And we had, I had a downturn in my business. I had 10 medical centers, about 40 docs who were working for me. And things were going sour. I couldn't figure out what to do. So uh, Sue and I started walking. And I was bouncing ideas off of her. And after a while, answers were coming to me, and they were working. And so as we were walking then, I'm looking at birds. And I bought her a pair of binoculars, and she's looking at birds. And we decided to leave the US for a bird trip. And our first trip was Costa Rica. And it was fabulous. 1989 was our first trip. And I decided this is my hobby forever. I can't wait to see everything else. When you see the tanagers, and when you see some of the very exotic species, not in the US, they're south of the border, I said, this is what I want to do. I'm still working. So I developed a plan. You need a plan if you're a world birder. Otherwise, you're seeing the same birds over and over and over again, which is fine. They're all good. But I wanted to see new birds. So I developed a scheme, a plan. Unfortunately, you can't see this the way I want you to see it. But I found out what countries have the most endemics. An endemic is a bird that's only in that country or in that region. And once you go to the endemics, everything else fills in. Hmm. So I tried that. Now, what are the top countries? Well, they are Australia and New Guinea. They have more species than any other country, including any country in South America. In South America, it's Colombia that has about 3,000 species. But Australia and New Guinea have more. So I started going here. And I worked my way down. Uh, I'm somewhere over here now. I don't know. But the US, on a, on a good day, on a good year, on a good 10 years, has no more than 900 species. So, and these other places have thousands of species. Now, why do they have thousands of species? Endemicity is created by geography. So if you have mountains and valleys and rivers and deserts, you have multiple biomes, you're going to create birds. That ge ge geology and geography will create new species. Because they can't interbreed. If they're in a valley in Peru, it cannot interbreed with the, the bird that's on top of the Andes. They can't fly like that. So they just grow and develop their own song, their own feather tracks, and they never interbreed with a neighbor. Now, I saw the horror when I was going around the world of indiscriminate desecrating our Mother Earth. This is Philippines, right in front of me, in a National Wildlife Refuge, National Wildlife Park. They're cutting, let me go back. They're cutting down trees. I could hear the saws. This is a protected land. The Philippines only have 2% of the forest left. Why? They sell their timber. And who are the pirates? Malaysia. Malaysia's all over this world. 
buying timber from everybody. Because they had no trees left of any consequence, you get landslides. And when you have landslides, you can't go forward. That's the, that's the end of your day. You're shot if you're a world burger. Forest fires could be man-made or could be made by nature. And vehicle breakdown, always. I've never been on a trip where a, a, a van didn't break down. Now, I'm in Cameroon, West Africa, 130 degrees ambient temperature. It was so hot, you couldn't sit on a rock, it would burn right through your jeans. And Cameroon is a terrible country. Why? The president steals everything. And the 40 million Cameroonians have nothing. Their subsistence, livers, whatever they can grow, that's what they eat. If they can keep a couple of chickens, that's what they eat. And the president's living in a grand palace with his buddies. And they take all the energy. They have hydroelectric dams all over the country. They take the energy and they sell it to all the surrounding nations, Nigeria, Central African Republic, et cetera, et cetera, Congo. These are three Rupel vultures in 130 degree heat, trying to stay cool. This was here at Bird Rookery Swamp, off of Immokalee. And this is a cottonmouth. This is a big cottonmouth, big guy. And it had rained heavily just before this, and it forced him out on the path. And so I used the car as a blind, and I got real close, and I took this photo. Its, its genus is Agachistron, Aga which means recurved teeth, which it has, fish eating, which it does. What happens when Habitat is destroyed at a revolutionary pace. This is Bachman's Warbler, gone. 1972 was the last time it was ever seen. It's a swamp bird, South Carolina, here in the States, and Cuba in the winter. Gone. Pollution, swamp destruction, and this is what happens. I got permission. This was at Tall Timbers, in northern Florida, in their museum. And the museum uh, curator allowed me to photograph it. By the way, it's B A C H, but it's not Bachman's. A lot of birders mispronounce it. It's Bachman's. He was a Protestant minister of German origin, and he pronounced his name Ba. I'm in Colombia here. I'm 75 years old. I'm riding a horse for two days. That was painful, I tell you. This is a Calibri del Sol, but I had to get there because there were three new birds for me. And I had to go up on this horse. And by the way, you see how short that horse is? Most of the time, my feet were dragging, and the stirrups were about the size of a little cup. I couldn't put my feet in, but I was determined. So I went up uh, with, uh, I named him Trigger. <laughs> I went up with Trigger, and here's why. This is an anthida which was newly discovered, and uh, it was called Fenwick's Anthida, after George Fenwick, who was president of American Birding Association. However, it was discovered that those who took the first specimen had cheated. They had no permission. They snuck in. They killed their specimen. 
And when the country of Colombia found out about it, they were arrested, they were prosecuted, the name of Fenwick was withdrawn, it's now called Arau and Pitta because of the region. At the same site was another Aunt Pitta, a new bird for me. It's 12,000 feet above sea level in Calibri del Sol. Calibri del Sol, the hummingbird of the sun. And no controversy with this. This is chestnut naped Aunt Pitta. Very rare bird. Now the prize. How to get off the horse and walk another 2,000 feet up. I got to uh, a little over 12,000 feet to get dusky star front legend. Newly discovered. Less than 10 people had seen it. I was in that tent. What a privilege to see this bird. The feeders were put up by the rangers and they were changed about every three days. Not too many visitors, but when they came, there was fresh nectar and they had a good chance of seeing this very, very rare bird. This is one of my best stories. I was in Ethiopia. I was on my way home. I had a whole day to kill before the airport. I said, I'll go to the National Museum. I went to the National Museum. And a guy came over to me, he saw I was in Ethiopia. He says, may I guide you through the museum? Well, great, yes, thank you. So he took me downstairs. We, we did the regular routine over here, ah, okay, that's all good. And he took me downstairs, put the lights on, took his keys out, opened the door, went in this room, put the lights on in the room, he goes, he says, sir, you're looking at Lucy. Lucy, this is the first hominin discovered by one of the leaky guys. 1974. Leaky trained all the monkey women. Give me a name. So. Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall. Tra Leaky trained Jane Goodall, the chimp. He trained the uh, uh, gorilla person. I forget their names. I apologize. Fossey. 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 Yeah. Right. And he trained the orangutan person. It's very interesting. They're all women. And except Johansson, who found Lucy. And before they went to Africa, you ready for this? They had to get their appendixes removed. So they wouldn't be, they wouldn't die if they had appendicitis. So here's Lucy. How old is Lucy? Somewhere between eight, uh, uh, three point nine and two point nine. This is the actual skeleton. This is not a wax uh, copy. This is Lucy. She stands about when she stands up. She's um, about a little over three feet. But what's the importance of Lucy? And I have, and she didn't. Her line died out. It didn't become on and on and on homo sapiens. It didn't become us. It died out. We have other, uh, uh, other species that developed in the homo, homo sapiens. The importance of Lucy, this was the first evidence that something they call her a hominin could walk upright, bipedal, now, what's the importance of bipedalism? Bipedalism allows you to run. And when you run, you can run down prey. 
And when you can run down big prey, and they, even today in Africa they do, you can run down antelopes, you have more protein. And when you have more protein, your brain expands. That's the importance of Lucy and her forerunners. Now, we're in Ghana. Susan and I are in Ghana. This is white neck pick authorities. It's a rock jumper. Very primitive. Look at it. Looks a lot like dino it's dinosaurian. There's one other in this genus, and I saw that one years before in Cameroon. Pick authorities. That was about what, 10, 15 feet in front of us. They're cave nesters. So if you know the cave, you hang out quietly, it'll come in. Ah, uh, Blakiston's fish owl. Ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at the largest owl in the world. It's bigger than the great horned owl that we have. It's bigger than the Eurasian owl. Uh, Eurasian owl. It uh, stands about over two feet, and it weighs a little, more, a little less than five pounds. Its wing spread is six feet, and it eats mainly fish. And we saw this in a Ryukan, which is an authentic Japanese hotel. We were wearing Japanese robes, and, and my grandson, my 16-year-old grandson was with us, and he was on the lookout because he heard it was coming in to a pond, a little pond with minnows. And he ran, Grandpa, 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 it's here, it's here. So we ran out, and I had my camera, and through a big glass plate window, I took this photo. This is Blakiston's fish owl. I'm going to go back because I got to tell you about Blakiston. Yeah. You know the story about Ernest Shackleton and endurance, how he went down to Antarctica and the boat, got stuck in the ice and crushed. They just found endurance, by the way, I guess a lot of you know that. And then he took 26 of his boatmates to safety over between seven and 800 miles in an open boat. Those kind of guys don't exist anymore. They just don't. They're tough. They never give up. They're smart. Blakiston was in that, that genre. Apropos to today, he was in the English artillery. They defeated the Russians in 1836 in the Crimea. I think we all know Tchaikovsky's it's a stirring overture about the Crimean War. There's a, big, there's a fight over Crimea now. He then went to Canada and joined the Palliser expedition to look for a Northwest Passage from Canada. Where's my Canadian friends? Yeah. And he had a fight with Pallister. So he left and he went on his own and found the passage on his own. Then he went to Asia. And he was a naturalist, but he was also trading goods, import and export. And that's where he found this. It had never been described before. And it eats mainly fish. It, it, it creeps up to a, a pond. It's in Russia, Japan, and China. That's it. It doesn't migrate. You'll never see it here in North America. Creeps up on the, on the pool where the minnows are, and boom, plunges his talons in there and grabs one. Eats that, grabs another one. Yeah, he died. He, Blakiston died in San Francisco. 
I researched him because I found his grave in Columbus, Ohio. Because <laughs> I knew about the owl. And I knew the name. And I said, what? I found it 30 years ago. Green Lawn Cemetery, famous burning spot. What is he doing here? This I need to research. But I found out that he died in San Francisco, but his English wife and family would not pay for the transfer to England to be buried. He had a second wife in Springfield, Ohio. And the authorities reached out to his second wife and the family. He said, sure, we'll take her. Springfield's about, what, 25, 30 miles away from Columbus. And they buried him there. He has a beautiful tombstone. All explains who he was. And every time I lead a walk there, I show the folks the Blakiston tomb, and I tell them the story. This is the largest ibis in the world. You take our little white ibis as you're driving along, poking, poking. This is twice as big. And less than 200. Only in Cambodia. How did it survive? This is a good story. Well, in the Middle Ages, the Cambodians, or the Khmer, built these trenches that were filled with water, and they're called trapeons. And they had fish, and they, the locals would take the fish, they'd go fishing, and they also, so would the ibises. <laughs> That's where they really fish. Well, the trapeons are still there after 500 years. But the people, the locals, were killing the ibis. You gotta remember, a lot of countries are protein poor. And what we consider to be outrageous behavior is survival for local people who need the protein. And so, one of my friends led a group there, and she counted 10 ibises, that's all, 10 giants. And she found out that they were killing them to eat. And so she said, I'm going to bring a group back next year, and every number of ibises above the 10, I will pay you X number of dollars in US dollars. Oh, would that work? Damn right it worked. She came back the second year, and there were 12 or 13. We came the fifth year, and there were about 20, but we slept in a, uh, a very rough uh, shack that the locals had built to bring tourists in. They put showers up. They had a mess hall, and they cooked food for us. And then I was told by my friend, they came back the next year, and they were selling t-shirts. I swear it. I'm not making this up. They were selling t-shirts. Now, ladies and gents, you're looking at a photo. I have the only one. This is the only photo of this species and this age in the world. And I defy you to find it anywhere else. You're looking at it. And it is a jungle flycatcher. It's in the Lesser Sundas, in the island of Flores. It's a russet-backed subspecies of jungle flycatcher, and it's very young. When this grows up, it loses its spots, and the back gets russet. I have the only photo of russet-backed jungle flycatcher in this age. It's less than a year old. This is Kagu. This is in the South Pacific. It's the only one in its family. And it has 
This, this is kind of amazing. Its closest relative by DNA is in Costa Rica, 14,000 miles away. The sun bitter, which is that. I just took this photo in October. They are closely related. Well, how did that happen? You know, tectonic plate movement? That's how it happened. This is in Sumatra, in Mount Karinchi. I thought I, thought I was looking at uh, one of the Three Stooges. <laughs> this is short-tailed frog mouth. I found this, we're up about 8,000 feet, and I heard, oh, oh. That's the bird I was looking for. It was in a dry riverbed. So I went and followed the sound, and with a light, a handheld light, I saw it up on a branch. So I set up my scope. I didn't have a camera. I wasn't shooting, actually shooting back then. Uh, I set up the scope, used the telescope as a lens, then put a little handheld camera on the scope. And when I had it sighted in, I put up with my left hand the light. And then I took the photo, and this is what I got. Ah, Susan found this. This, <laughs> this is South Moluccan Aunt Pitta on the island of Buru in West Papua. That's part of Indonesia. Remember, Indonesia is an island country, thousands of islands. This is Buru. Sue found this. This is about six inches off the ground. It's only on two islands. Very rare bird and a beautiful bird. This is one of the BOPs, Birds of Paradise. It's Wilson's on the island, same trip, island of Waigio, one of the next islands over, Western Papua. He's attracting, this is a male, he's doing a dance, and he's trying to attract a female. This is the only bird on my list of 8,325 that I've never seen. But I'll tell you why I'm counting it. This is in New Zealand. And Sue and I looked all morning in the river for it. Fjordland crested penguin. Never could find it. Ah, oh, we came, got out of the boat, came into the forest on a boardwalk. And I saw this stuff. These are feathers. Ah, oh, yeah. This this bird is molting. It was in the season that it would change feathers. So I followed it. Well, we followed it. And it went off the boardwalk and went into the woods and we just followed it. And it went to a big tree and there was a hole in the ground under the tree. And the feathers led right to that hole. Well, it was too small for me to get in. So I lowered my camera, put the flash on it, and just blindly took a picture, and that's what I got. <laughs> but I'm counting it. <laughs> Fjordland crushes hanging. Ah, uh, this is a phenomenal beast. This is one of the largest moths in the world. It's in Brazil at Itatiaia, and it, it shows two things that nature has produced. This is called Loxolomia serpentina. The serpentina part comes from this. Oops, sorry. Comes from this. This, the head of a serpent, and the head of the serpent, okay? To scare away predators. 
This is part of the wing. It looks like a fallen branch. This is 10 inches across. There are two in this genus in Brazil, no other place in the world. This is his body and this is his head and his wings are here. An amazing animal. If you like dogs, same family. It's in the Canid, C-A-N-I-D family. This is a wolf. It's called a maned, M-A-N-E-D, wolf, because of the hair that starts on the back of his neck and goes all the way down. This is Rosie. Less than 250 left in the world, critically in danger. The rangers knew her. They knew she was four years old. They knew she had to have a litter. They knew there were 250 left in the world, Brazil and Argentina. Look at the, look, oh, darn it. Look at, look at the length of the legs. They live in high grass. That's why the legs are so tall. So they can maneuver very quickly. This is the last hummingbird new to science. It was named about a year and a half to two years. Dry forest saber wing. Yeah, dry forest saber wing in Brazil. And they didn't know what it was until somebody actually studied it. They thought it was a another species, another saber wing, but it wasn't. Different habitat different call, different everything. Now this is back to Florida. This is at Crandon Park on the other side, on the eastern side. This is least greed that was accidental here from the Caribbean last year. Sue and I saw it, I photographed it. Well, I figured, what's it doing? But what's it, what, what it's doing is, it's plucking a feather out of its side. I thought that was odd. Why would it pluck its own feather? Well, here's why. It would swallow them and create in its throat passage a filter. All grebes do this, I found out. I didn't know it at the time, I researched. Well, what's the filtering? When they eat fish, they filter the bones out. When they eat mollusks, they filter the shells out. And then they regurgitate it. Amazing adaptation. The pine bill grebe, which a lot of you birders know, does the same thing. Rufus hummingbird. This belongs in California, and I photographed this in Sugar Creek, Ohio, it was way lost. <laughs> so what happens to these birds when they're, they're lost? Probably one of three things. They either perish because of the weather or a predator, or they find their way back and then come again the next year. I've seen that happen. Or they continue to go east and wind up in Cape May, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. This is in my backyard. This is ruby-throated hummingbird coming to the feeder that's set up. And this is a mantid, but it's the Carolina mantid. It's the, low, it's the American mantid. And I, and I showed this on Facebook, and I went, oh, oh, can you, can you move it? Look. There is, I researched this for days. There is no record of a Carolina, sorry, of a Carolina mantid ever taking a hummingbird. But the exotic Chinese mantid, which is much larger, will take a hummingbird. They're much larger, they have larger claws, 
and they can take and kill Molly Burke. This was, this was an American mansion. This is the rarest heron in the world. This is in Bhutan. This is white-bellied heron, only in Bhutan, critically endangered. Now, what, I've been using this term, critically endangered and endangered. Let me give you my definition. Critically endangered is defined as a 90% chance of being extinct in 10 years. In other words, it's so unlikely that it'll recover. Why? Because the gene pool is so shallow. And then recessive genes take over. And recessive genes, most likely, are the disease genes. Also, they can't find a partner. So, this to me has a 90% chance of being extinct in 10 years. Endangered definition, or my definition, is a 50% chance of being extinct in 50 years. So that we can save those species by proper husbandry. Now, I parked, my car. <laughs> I parked my car in Brazil and forgot where I parked it. I came back the next day and everything grows so great there. But that's a joke. <laughs> ah, we all have seen, a lot of us have seen this in Florida. It's a western bird. It's Texas, Oklahoma, but a lot of them come here. Scissor tail flycatcher. So I'm in uh, Colombia, northern Colombia, and I'm with my bird and buddy, Forrest, Forrest Roland. Um, and we see a bird, and we're walking by, oh, is this a yeah, yeah, nice bird. Yeah. I got home, he got home. Three weeks later, he called me and said, Bernie, did you photograph that, that flycatcher? I said, no, why? He said, that's the first record for South America. <laughs> What's the moral of that story? Know your bird list. If I had known they had never been seen in Colombia, I would have been all over that bird. And uh, obviously, first record in Colombia. This is one of the rarest ducks in the world. Brazilian merganser, less than 200 left. Okay, this is in Brazil. It's only, they only are found on very extreme rushing rivers. And there were five that day. I caught three in a little group. And again, it's very, very endangered. This bird is a flycatcher in Brazil. Nobody knows what it is. It has not been studied. It has not been named. We know it's in the genus Tomomias, and that's all we know. This bird is in Tocantins, Brazil. Nobody knows what it is. They know the genus because of the feather tracks but they know more than that. The DNA has not been studied. The vocalizations have not been studied, which are two of the things you study besides feather tract. What's it look like? You study the DNA and you study the vocalizations to make a definite um, identification. So we don't know. I keep checking. I keep checking. Do they know? Do they know nothing? There's no money for this kind of stuff. No, you know, we're not, we have so many other problems that need attention, especially today. There's, there's no money left to study a, a rare bird in, in Argentina, or this was Brazil. Yeah. Okay, same area. Blue-eyed ground dove, 
new to science, found by an engineer who was mapping out a grassland area so that they would build, I'm guessing, a park, a building, a gas station, God knows what. 20, that's all. 20 left. It's now a reserve, and maybe it'll come back. It, it has a genuine blue eye, which I really didn't capture well here. This is Primer's parakeet, another endangered parrot. And this is where it lives. It's a cave dweller. It's very rare for parrots. Most parrots don't live in, they live in holes in trees. This bird lives in caves. And this is Ketchmer's uh, woodpecker, extremely rare, Brazil. And it's a beautiful bird, but hardly any left. This is white rump sandpiper. And I've never seen this in Florida. The cool thing about this sandpiper, it's migrational trip down to Antarctica, this is in Antarctica, and back to the Arctic, 18,400 miles for this little guy. How does he do it? And I've never seen it in Florida. I'm, I'm here at the wrong time. You can see this bird in uh, late April and early May, if you're lucky. It's rare to uncommon. This is a guy, if I had a hat, I'd take it off to him. This is Alexander Scutch, an ornithologist. He was 88 years old at this picture. He has written over 100, you got to listen to this, because there's, there's a story here. He has written over 100 ornithological books. He was trained at Johns Hopkins. MRI. Over a hundred books, papers, uh, er and articles related to birds. He lives off the grid. He wrote all these articles on an electric typewriter powered by a car battery. <laughs> he had nothing. And yet he contributed so much to ornithology. And when I think about him, and when I see our kids, our grandchildren, who have everything, and what are they accomplishing? Unless they have powerful parents and grandparents, they won't accomplish much. Now the next guy, I'm not going to show you his photo yet, is unknown to almost every 330 million Americans, yet he changed the course of American history. And Duke, you're going to be glad to see him. You may know about him. You may know. We have um, a, a wonderful patriot in our audience who is a Vietnam veteran. And uh, he was commandant of the Pentagon during his service, at the end of his service. So he may know. But here is. Where's your hand, dude? There you go. Aaron Kumana, Solomon Islander. Well, why is he so famous? He was in the island of Gizu in Middle Solomons. He was a plane spotter in World War II. So when Japanese planes came over, or ships came by, he would notify the Allies how many, what they were, and where they were going. He and his buddy were out on the Gizu Island when they saw a Japanese destroyer come and mow down PT-109 that John F. Kennedy was in command of. Everyone was killed except JFK. And he swam to a small island. They took their outrigger canoe 
and rowed out there, put them in the boat, took them back to Giza, notified the Allies, and he rejoined the Allied command. Because of this man, we have, J we have JFK in our history books. Now, <laughs> yes, Virio, by the way, Bill, Master I. Okay. And Master I is my last name, Latinized. In 1991, I was a governor of BirdLife International in Cambridge, volunteer. BirdLife is the United Nations of Bird Conservation. And we would pick out projects that we would fund. And I would fly to Cambridge twice a year. And we got this message that this bird was discovered in Colombia on the Pacific Slope around 4,500 feet above sea level in an area of high biodiversity. But the native peoples were cutting down at a tremendous rate the forest and, and feeding their cattle and sundry other things. They needed money and they would give for those who stepped up, only one person did, they would name the bird after that person. Well, this is, this is right down my alley. <laughs> Conservation, a new bird. So I gave him the money. It was over six figures. Here's what it created. The area was Rio Nambi on the Pacific Slope of Colombia. It was set up as a reserve. There's no more cutting. There's no more feeding of cattle. Well, how do we supplant the lost revenue to the locals. Here's how we did it. We created a reserve and invited bird touring groups to come in, pay the locals. They kept all the money. Actually, it was a lot more than they were making doing what they were doing. It became the prototype for the state of Columbia for 19 more. There are 20 because of this, Rio Nambi. There are 20 now in the country of Colombia because of this. Because this works. You give local people a stake in protection and they'll, they'll respond. So now, one other thing while I have your attention. The name, Virio Masteri. How did that name come about? Well. The ornithologist that was working there was a Brit married to a Colombian woman. And he was studying the biodiversity in this area. And one morning he woke up and in his mist nets, these are finely netted uh, traps, don't harm the bird. But then you take that bird out in the morning and you measure it, wing cord from here to here, you blow the feathers off the head to see the age of the bird. You weigh it, make all the measurements, and you record that. He looked at the bird, he said, I've never seen this before. His name is Paul Solomon. He's still alive. He went, he fell asleep. When he woke up, the bird had been the skin bird had been devoured by ants. He had nothing. He had done no measurements. He hadn't prepared the skin. It's gone. Of course, <laughs> I put myself in his place and you know, I'm still kicking myself. You know. Three years later, Gary Stiles, a compatriot, another ornithologist, 300 miles away, found a similar bird. And he knew by, by the description from his friend that it was the same bird. So he contacted him. He says, I've got your bird. But Gary didn't fall asleep. 
He measured it. He took the innards out. He prepared that skin. You prepare the skin so you can show it to all the other scientists. And they will say, I've seen that before. And it is called Vireo whatever. Or I have never seen that before. Not one of his ornithological compatriots had ever seen it. OK. So where's the, the Vireo? Vireo is the genus. And the genus is composed of many species, look-alike or sound-alike species. Well, it looked like a vireo. The feather tracks look like a vireo. And they hadn't heard it yet. Later, we heard it. And so he, um, he said, it is new. And I'm going to publish it. And he did in the European Ornithological Journal, the Ida. Why do you publish? You give it a shot to every birder, scientist, ornithologist in the world to say, oh, I've seen that. I've got it in my skin here in Vienna. You know, 200 years ago, so and so collected it. Nobody popped up. And so the name Virio Maseri stuck. It may be removed 100 years from now if somebody in Berlin finds it, the skin in his lab with the date and a different name. But so far, nobody. So Maseri remains in perpetuity. Now, here's something a lot of people don't know, including scientists. Where's Matt? Matt, I was telling you this the other day. The second word, master eye, is not the species. The species is virio master eye. It's two words. The second word is the epithet, or the specific epithet. I've actually read books where scientists didn't know that. So Homo sapiens, that's our species. Homo is our genus. Sapiens is our epithet. Combined is the species. Now we're back in Naples. <laughs> this is a place we stayed in a couple of years ago. I will now take questions. Thank you. Very much enjoyed it. I think we have time for maybe two or three questions. Is that all right? And then we can of course. Uh, so I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> questions? Anybody? I'd like to know whether or not you're. Uh, Excuse me. Matt. I'd like to know whether or not your favorite bird is one that you have seen or one that you have not. <laughs> My favorite bird is Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> Actually, my favorite bird is the next one that I've never seen. Because I like them all. I really do. I love it when our old friends come back every spring into my yard. And I see them in the trees or on the ground. I just love it. I don't care how many times I see them. They're just fantastic. I know that Audubon uh, was famous for, for his birding, but he, but he killed a lot of birds to, uh, to, to do so. How did they get the, uh, the, the DNA for the, uh, for the, for the yeah. birds there in terms of um, testing? They don't kill birds anymore. It's a good question. <laughs> they do blood samples. So they capture the bird, maybe through mist nets, and then they draw a sample, DNA, and that's it. It's so benign. It doesn't hurt the bird. Maybe one more question. Yeah. Uh, I thanks, thanks for, your, for your talk. That was, that was awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, 
have any of the birds that you've seen since gone extinct? Yes, they have. I've seen, I can count three birds that I've seen over my X number of years that are no longer with us. Sphinx's macaw in Brazil. I saw that in 2000. There was only one male in the wild. And I wasn't photographing then. But I saw it in the scope. It's a good story. I was, we were down there in the tour. And I said, are we going to see Spixus? He said, oh, no, we're not. No, we're not allowed in there. I hate no. <laughs> I said, you call him up and tell him Bernard Masters here from BirdLife International. We funded that group. Their money came from me and others on council. Come right over. <laughs> We had to follow the rules. We didn't want anybody walking down to his tree where it hung out. It was just one male. And he was hanging out with a, a blue-winged female macaw. Because there were no female spixes around. They were all gone. They were in cages somewhere in Saudi Arabia. Some of these collectors that would like to have rare birds. So, we were told, you can't go down. But then the, the curator or director changed his mind. He said, we'll allow two at a time to go down, 15 minutes apiece. OK, fair enough. At least he got a shot at it. So two of our people rushed ahead of everyone else and ran down ahead of everyone else to see it. And as justice prevails in the universe, that bird flew up over and landed in a tree right in front of the rest of the group. <laughs> and they never saw it. They never saw it. OK, the second bird is uh, in Brazil. It's in the old in Brazil. Um, it's uh, the bristle front, and very hard to see. It's in a reserve. Interesting story. There were 18 in existence, 16 on one side of the river, and two on the other side. The 16 were burned up in a forest fire. That left two in the whole world. So I knew I was going there, and I got permission from the government to go in there. And I went in there with Forrest, with a mutual friend. And I don't know how I was going to see it. It was an impenetrable forest. There were no paths. And the, the ranger said, well, you got to listen for it. And then if you hear it, go to that section, and you might get lucky and see it. All right, we'll try it. So I walked up this very steep forest hill heard it. By the way, when you count birds on your life list, herds do count. You're allowed to count a herd bird, even if you don't see it. So, so as soon as I heard it, well, it was already on my list. But I really wanted to see it. And we found a little path, little footpath. Went in, and I heard the bird was coming closer and closer. And it was right in front of me, and I couldn't see it. So I got down, got down on my belly to see it, to get a, a, a sight line. And I saw it come, head, body, tail. Check. <laughs> You're done. I got it. But then I wanted the photo. I never could get a clear photo because of the, all the, uh, the bushes and trees around it. And the third would be um, I'm losing it. Oh, OK. 
Third bird, um, she fixes. Uh, there's one more that uh, I can't think of it right now. I'll probably tonight, like, <laughs> or two in the morning. I need your phone number, so. I, I, yeah, I got it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, then you have three, and I'll never see again. Yeah? Okay, last question right here. Hello. What's the hurry? I'm <laughs> uh, having a great time here. <laughs> I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, your kind words. I was ready to give your money back if you didn't like it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bertie. We appreciate it very much. Uh, you It's absolutely incredible to have somebody with your talent to Thank you. Uh, and I also want to once more thank you and your wife both for providing the funds that allow us to have this. I think it was almost every every year over the last 10 years. Yeah, every year. I'd like to take another minute, Bill. Okay, you want another minute? I need another minute. Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. is, everybody here had some history lessons. Back in the day, the patronage system where someone who had some money could support an artist, a scientist, someone who is contributing to the good of the public. And Bill is that person, and I was that patron. Master, if she won't, she did off. It's always Bernie and Susan when we talk about supporting this thing. So I want. To... <laughs> and you never know; there might be a moonlight on the Marsh series that pops up in Ohio or down here. Well, I hope you're with Tom Brady yeah. and come back and say I'm coming out of retirement now. Okay. <laughs> So thank you all for coming, and uh, we have one more lecture by some guy I heard of next week.